Thank you, Miss Allison. Let's all stand together. We've got Miss Allison on the piano there, and I'm glad about that. And I'm glad we're um, having this session together, combating, confronting unbelief with effective evangelistic congregational group singing. And uh, Pastor said it as we were, were leaving the, the building, the auditorium. Um, most important music of our church is our congregational music. Why do we say that congregational music is most important? Well, there's lots of reasons. I can give you pragmatic reasons. You know, that that's a time to get all of God's people involved. I mean, that's a pragmatic reason, a, a logical reason. But here's a biblical reason. The emphasis in the Bible, if you go through all the scriptures, all 754 references to music, all 330 passages in the Bible about music, the most often music in the Bible is group singing. It's not the soloist. It's not the quartet. I like a men's quartet. But the emphasis in the Bible is not on the men's quartet. It's not on the choir. Man, I love the Crown College Choir. And all God's people said, Amen. I love that choir. And Dr. Thompson's in here with us. I love it. But really it's the congregational singing. That's what's emphasized in the Bible. The one time we find Christ singing in the Bible, the one time that we find Christ singing in the Bible, He's singing with His disciples. It's group singing. And so we're going to talk for just a little while today, and I'm going to try to go as fast as I can, and I hope you'll take some notes. And then we're going to turn this place into a little bit of a laboratory and have a little congregational song leading going on. But let's have prayer right now, may we? Thank you, Lord, for letting us be together. We love how you're leading Baptist friends. We love you, Lord, and we want to do your work your way. Thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I do not care for anemic congregational singing. I don't care for sloppy congregational singing. I don't care for half-hearted congregational singing. You know, I was at a church recently. That church has been in revival for two years. This church has been in revival for two years. This church is on fire. They're planting another church. They're enlarging their auditorium. Their building is maxed out. They're seeing people saved. They're seeing people baptized. They had me there doing many things, but one thing I was doing was teaching them brand new songs that they had never seen before. They have our hymnal, Bible Truth Hymns, and out of their hymnal I was teaching them songs they had never seen before. "'Tis the blessed hour of prayer when our hearts slowly bend." And we gather to Jesus, our Savior and friend. Well, they didn't know the song. There's several songs they did not know. I'm teaching them brand new songs. But let me tell you something. They were singing them at the top of their lungs. They don't know them. But they're singing at the top of their lungs. Friends, when a congregation, when their hearts are full of Christ, they will sing. Revival and singing go together. I've never seen a big work of God in a congregation that the congregation didn't sing. I've been in some meetings some evangelistic meetings that, I mean, things were just so good and so vibrant that I've seen it this way. The song leader would get up and say, number 32, and people would start glorifying God just hearing the number. Hallelujah! Well, you don't even know what number 32 is. No, but if it's in that book, we like it, Brother Fox. <laughs> on fire, vibrant. Shouldn't God's people be on fire? Amen. Some real zeal, some joy of the Lord, some fervency. Oh, and we need all that in our singing. I'm, I'm not interested in anemic and weak and lackluster and half-hearted. No, I'm not interested in any of that. Let me give you a, a few notes. Number one, congregational music should be for the glory of God. Congregational music should be for the glory of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, which includes congregational singing, whatsoever you do, do all for the glory, to the glory of God. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so all of our congregational singing is for God 
is about God and it's to God. That's the directions. And uh, the congregational singing is to advance the cause of Christ and should motivate people uh, to uh, bless their Lord and to uh, launch out at His command and, and uh, do exactly what God has bid us to do. Number one, congregational music for, should be for the glory of God. Number two, congregational music should be for the furtherance of the gospel. For the furtherance of the gospel. Now, what exactly is the gospel? It's the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the central theme of the entire Bible. The gospel is a central theme of the entire Bible. Now, if I did not have my Bible, I would not know cosmogony. There's a big word. I've been waiting all day to say the word cosmogony. The study of how things came to be. You know, evolution is just silly. Amen. But my Bible tells me how this world came to be. But you know, <laughs> all of the Bible, it's all aimed toward our Savior and the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of it is aimed that way. And so, with our congregational music, we sing about many things. We sing about many things with the congregation. We sing about creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. Yeah, we, we sing about that. We, um, we sing about prayer. We sing about the Lord's soon return. We sing about the Bible. But the thing we sing the most, the thing we sing about more than anything else is the gospel of Jesus Christ. These songs that I said, these five songs that I've tried to write in the last few days uh, to be released in October, the pressure is on. I've got to get these things finished and uh, get them recorded and get the music uh, typeset and proved and printed and distributed, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of work to this. But uh, two of these five are just completely confrontational. Are you saved? Are you saved? And uh, give your heart to Jesus is the title of one of them. The other is, what will you do? What will you do? Will you accept Christ or will you reject Christ? Uh, of the other songs, I wrote a song about God's peace. Boy, when you're saved and walking with God, there, there's not a thing for a Christian to worry about. What should we be worried about? God is in charge. <laughs> I'm a child of the King. And I wrote a little song, Peace, Sweet Peace. Um, but all, the, all of our congregational singing, all of it, all of it is for the glory of God. And number two, it is for the furtherance of the gospel. Number three, congregational music should teach Bible doctrine. Congregational music should teach Bible doctrine. Now, all music teaches. All music. All music is teaching something. All music is teaching something. And music is a great teaching tool. In uh, the golden age of memory, you know, uh, six years old, seven years old, eight years old, ten years old, that golden age of memory, we teach little boys and girls things. When I was six years old, I learned this song. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I can still sing it, man. Now I never will forget how to say my alphabet. I learned it, man. I can still sing it. Miss Barba was my first grade teacher. She had a ruler. She could straighten kids up back in those days. <laughs> but she taught me. And I can still sing those songs. And um, uh, listen, write it down. What is learned in song is remembered long. That's just true. People forget what the preacher even preached, but they remember what they sang. There's lots of reasons for that. Do you know when, do you know that when we sing, both sides of our brain are in operation? Both sides of our brain are in operation when we sing. When we stand around talking, huh, only one side's working. <laughs> so we, and we're not always sure that even one side's working. <laughs> but music is a great teaching tool. It's a phenomenal teaching tool. And so we're trying to indoctrinate. All right, say, so Brother Fox, what is doctrine? What is 
doctrine. Is that when you get sick and you need some doctrine? <laughs> Go to the doctor and get some doctrine? No. Doctrine just simply means teaching. Teaching. And we have a country that is now in a famine. We are in a spiritual drought in America. And there needs to be some teaching, some plain teaching of the Word of God. And one of the best ways to teach the Word of God and to teach doctrine is with music. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Is that true? Amen. Well, yes, it's true. If you get to heaven, it's going to be by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no other way. And um, so we indoctrinate folk. We indoctrinate folk about the resurrection. That's part of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. What kind of Savior do we serve? I serve a risen, risen Savior. That is prominent doctrine. Do we realize that if a person does not believe the resurrection, they are not saved? You are not saved if you do not believe the resurrection. That's what the Romans road says, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Believe that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. You deny the resurrection, then you're not saved. Well, our music, we're indoctrinating people. <laughs> it's not just filler. Say, so Brother Fox, why do you have all that congregational singing at the church? Why do you sing, try to sing all those hymns? Why are you doing all that just to get uh, everybody's attention and get them all in the right seat and, and uh, get everybody excited because maybe you're going to take an offering and get people excited to put something in? No, no. God love the cheerful giver. Amen. We, y'all with me? Amen. We're not just trying to stir people mere emotions. No. There is grand work going on with this congregational music. Number one, we're trying to glorify God. Our most recent God Bless America event that we had in, in um, sep last past September in Richmond, Virginia, Brother Marco came and worked so hard with me and saw close to 100 people saved in your soul, 89 people, something like that. He was out sowing in day and night, feeding homeless people, um, doing surveys on the streets. It's great. But as I was praying, one Thursday morning about that crusade that we were going to have in an athletic building that we transformed into a big auditorium for the glory of God. God spoke to my heart. I was impressed from the Bible and through my prayer time that if we get in that room, that gigantic room that seated 6,000, if we get in that room and if we start glorifying God and we start worshiping Him, that we'd get to see God do some great and mighty things. Can I tell you, my Muslim friend got saved Sunday night after that service. Amen. Amen. But we got in that place and we began to worship God. And we saw people saved. I was out uh, inviting people to come and met a, a man who has uh, uh, been a soldier, retired, all that, been honored and so forth. I got him to come. I put him on the front row. He and his wife. And we got in that room and began to worship God in song and glorifying God as a big congregation of many saved people and many lost people. And my two friends on the front row that I'd met out soul winning, out door knocking, that had come and were seated on the front rows, significant people. What'd they do? John Reynolds preached the gospel that night and they got saved. Amen. Amen. We got in there and worshiped God in song and in spirit. And, and God blessed and worked. Listen, number one, our congregational music is for God's glory. Number two, our congregational music is for the furtherance of the gospel. Number three, our congregational music must teach Bible doctrine. We're never, we're never interested, never interested in singing any song contrary to the Bible. Amen. Number four, Congregational music should be appropriate to your church. Congregational music should be appropriate to your church. You know, I get to, I get to preach all across America. I get to preach in regal places, regal, sophisticated. And Brother Fox does have a few shirts with cufflinks. 
I, I can somewhat acclimate to that group. And um, I'm thinking last year of a place that I preached that I'm in Regal, the very best church orchestra that I heard in the last 12 months was at this church. This orchestra, was, I'm phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, about 750 folk there, uh, 120 in the choir. Significant music program, significant. And uh, the, the music uh, was also uh, sophisticated, a little more devotional in style, all that. I'm there to preach as an evangelist. And, uh, and so we did the sophisticated music and so forth. After a while, I led some singing. And I said to the pianist, I said, I want you to play the way you think I would play it. <laughs> I said, imagine me and my personality, how I would play this. I said, we're going to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. So, and I said, I'm not going to scare anybody in this room. I said, but we need to get a little stirred up for Jesus Christ today. I, I don't want us, I do not want us to just go through the motions. Amen. But at the same time, I recognized the culture. I had doctors, I had lawyers in that room, all this. By the way, we had revival at that church. Can I tell you who led the way? The teenagers and the millennials. They led the way. In fact, in every great revival I've ever read about, it's been millennials and teenagers because their will is still so pliable. But I, I chose music while I was there. I chose music mostly that would fit that particular culture that I was in. The very next meeting that I went and preached, I drove up a mountain in North Carolina. And I'm finally on a dirt road and gravel road. I'm driving up the road and my, my, um, my GPS girl, I have so many ladies keeping me straight, my wife, my daughter, my mom, my mother-in-law, and a GPS girl, and a Siri girl inside my phone. I got a lot of girls, a lot of ladies trying to keep me straight, man. I'm going up that mountain and GPS girl said, you have arrived. No, I hadn't. <laughs> I'm surrounded by trees. I said, GPS girl, there's not a building in sight. <laughs> I kept driving up that mountain, got to the top of the mountain. There was a white building, no steeple, no church sign. I said, that's got to be it. I'd never been there before. Went inside, found 150 mountain Christians, and they were singing the roof off. 150, 50 of them were in the choir. That's the right kind of percentage, isn't it? One third of the folk were in the choir. They had a bass guitar beside the piano. Boom, 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 boom. That's their culture. Nothing wrong with that. They probably have a banjo at that church occasionally. That's not of the devil. You can use a banjo for God. And while I was there, I acclimated with that particular group. I asked a man last night at this church service, last night, Afterward, we was talking about different songs. I said, you heard that song, I'll Fly Away? He said, no, sir, I've never heard that song. Well, at that church I'm telling you about on top of that mountain, that's opening song on Sunday morning. <laughs> that's music of the common man. I'll Fly Away is music of the common man. At your church, wherever you serve, and in the culture, because to, to some degree you acclimate to your culture. We are in Tennessee here. Have you noticed? Hello? Amen. And so it should to some degree reflect the culture and so forth, but it's still all for the glory of God. Listen, God has made a big variety of music that we can use. A big variety. And we'll talk some more about that as we go along here. There's big variety among God's music. You say, well, yeah, Brother Fox, that's why I use Christian rap at my church because I want big variety. I'm not, hey, I am not advocating worldliness at all. I believe, I believe the greatest stronghold on our country, and I've thought about this a lot, I believe the greatest stronghold on our country is worldly music. 
I believe it's the biggest stronghold on our country. And the people who come into our churches, so many of them can sing every song that's popular among the world that's talking about immorality and talking about uh, cheating and talking about getting drunk and, and uh, living for self. The, the music of the world does not honor the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's not its goal. The goal of the world's music is not to glorify God. And our people are enamored with it. And it, it's, I believe it is the biggest stronghold in our country. Oh, that we would use this congregational music. <laughs> that we would use it for the glory of God, to further the gospel, to teach uh, the doctrines of the Bible. And then uh, at your church, select music appropriate to your congregation. Now, let's talk some practical things. I want to make sure I get to this. How should you, if you're the song leader, how many of you here, here have ever led singing at a church, ever led singing in a Sunday school? This very, hey, this very morning, this very morning, had a little conversation on the phone. There's a man 86 and a half years old. That's what he said. He said it was 86 and a half. I guess once you get in the 80s, you go back to adding that half on. <laughs> He's 86 and a half. He's still the song leader in his Sunday school class. He has 100 in his Sunday school class. Amen. And he's the song leader of that class. Wow. And he's still happy about it. He got out of the hospital yesterday. He said, yeah, I've got to get to church. I've got to lead singing. <laughs> Well, all right. How many of you have led singing in Sunday school, uh, all that? Yes, in church, in services, at the rescue mission, at the nursing home. Get to lead singing. All right, let's talk some practical things. How do you introduce the song? Let's get our pianist in place, Miss Allison. I'm glad she's helping us today. How do you introduce the song? All right, if you are the person that starts the service. You know, here Pastor Sexton always goes up and get a little word of greeting and so forth, and he calls out the, the number. Some churches do that, but often, often it's the song leader that actually goes first. So how do you introduce the song? Well, you walk on purpose. You walk with purpose to the pulpit. You do everything on purpose. You walk with purpose. Don't drag. Get with it, man. This is your opportunity. This is uh, your um, uh, time. And you call out the number. Number 289. You that have books, find hymnals. Several of you have hymnals. I think we've uh, given all of them out. 289. You walk with purpose. You call out the number. 289. That's 289. 289. Let's all stand as we sing all praise to Him. All praise to Him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave His Son for man to die, that He might man redeem. All right, be seated. Now, you notice a few things. I walked up, I spoke out. I spoke up. I wanted to take command of the building. It's my turn. And like an admiral, I want to give some instructions. So how you introduce the song? You walk with purpose. You state the number, 289, and you speak up. Now, did I only say the number one time? No. Why? Because people don't listen. <laughs> and sometimes people can't hear very well. Number 289. Then did you notice what I said? That's 289. I said it a different way. I'm still trying to get everybody's attention. Now, did I say it with a smile or did I say, get your hymnal? <laughs> <laughs> I sat in my office as a 19-year-old boy, a 19-year-old boy on staff to be the minister of music. That was my title. And I sat in that room and I thought, how would a real song leader introduce the song? And I thought about Harold Seitler and Lee Robertson. Those were two of the best leaders I knew. I thought, how would Dr. Seitler introduce that? Dr. Seitler was not a singer, but he was a commander. I said, how would 
Dr. Robertson, Dr. Robertson was a singer. How would they do it? And I began to write down my verbiage that I would use. I would encourage all song leaders, I mean details, man, details. The devil's in the details and so is God. Get the details, man. Write out exactly how you want to say it and be yourself. Now this smile is me. I'm just, I'm happy. I can't help it, friends. Amen. There's a sunny precept in the Bible. What is it? Rejoice evermore. And I like it. I like getting to rejoice. And so get up there, introduce the song, call out the number, say it more than one way. Number 289, 289. Now when you first get up there, say something like this. Everybody get a hymnal. See, I thought Dr. Robertson, he'd tell everybody what to do. Everybody pick up a songbook. Everyone get a hymnal. Get, you master your statement. Write it down. Say it. I mean, actually go to your room, get in front of the mirror, and practice. I'm not kidding. If you're serious about it, you, uh, Ronald Reagan was known as the great communicator. Do you think he practiced? Yes, he did. Tear down that wall. He said he said that those words over and over and over again, different ways he could say it. And that was one of his famous statements that he made. And he worked on the voice inflection and so forth. Well, we song leaders. Let's take command when it's our turn. Let's have our statements prepared. Now, some, some song leaders talk too much. I'm so glad to see everybody here today. Oh, hey, Henry, good to see you back there. That's great, man. You go fishing this past week? You, did you catch anything? Hey, it's not time to do that. <laughs> do that after church. It's not time to do that. No, no. Get your job done. Get it said in a few words, but give them enough words and give them clear instruction of exactly what you want them to do. So, how to introduce a song. Make your clear statements. Uh, master them. And, uh, and then, now we want to get everyone singing. So you've made your introduction. Get a hymnal, 289, 289. That's 289. And then what I often do is I'll give the first few words, like I did just then, all praise to Him who reigns above. Hey. That's still helping acclimate people to the exact song. And those who are a little bit behind still trying to find 289 in that book, you've got them focused now. And, um, and Allison, she did a wonderful job doing that little introduction. Did you notice how well she did? She played with confidence. She played about the right tempo, all those things. Now, you've got to activate the people. A after you have introduced the next thing, you've got to activate the people. You've got to get them to sing. And you make a statement something like this, let's all stand. There you go again, just telling everybody what to do. We bossy song leaders. Yeah, you've got to get them singing. You've got to give them clear instruction. Everybody get a songbook. 289, that's 289. 289, all praise to Him who reigns above in majesty supreme. Have a little rise and fall to your voice. Let's all stand. Now, usually when I do that, let's all stand, I try to get it at speed. I'm trying to get the whole congregation to rise up like a big choir. I bend those knees and all that. I'm trying to get everybody, come on, man, let's all do it. I'm, I'm trying to get all that going, you know. Get them to stand up, get them to sing. You notice in this meeting, as, and I'm not a great song leader, uh, Jesus Christ is great. Amen. I'm His servant. I do this. God has me doing it. A lot of times by about that second or third verse, once the people are really singing, I, this happens. I say, oh, good. That's right. Yes. I'm cheering that congregation on. I, when they're doing well, commend them. Commend them when they're doing well. Pin some roses on.
There's two ways out in the country. There's two ways to get a donkey to work, you know. You can use two by fours. <laughs> That's one way. Uh, or you can use some carrots, you know. And so I've learned when, people, when you catch people doing the right thing, commend them, encourage them, invigorate them, get them doing the right thing, and try to keep them doing the right thing. Now, does the choir, let's think about this, does the choir have impact on the congregational singing? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We want that choir leading the congregational singing. We're trying to have a 1,000 voice choir this September the 11th in Charleston, West Virginia. We're trying to do something significant. The biggest choir we've had in a, one of our crusades so far is 622. We're trying to have 1,000. Does that sound good to you? W wouldn't you like that, uh, Dr. Thompson? 1,000 voice, uh, well-trained. I've got six major rehearsals next month. I mean, all the choir folks already have their music. Today at 10 o'clock, I had an automatic email that went to all the choir members that said many things, telling this announcement, that announcement. And at the end of it, it said, have you listened to your rehearsal CD? Respond yes or no. And about 30 and 40 minutes afterwards, people w went and got their CD, listened to it a little bit, wrote back, said, yes, we have. <laughs> now, every Thursday, I send that out to all these choir folks. You got to invigorate people. But now this choir, whoo, this major choir up here. I like big choirs. I like fervent choirs. I like trained choirs. Man, a choir can, man, let me tell you something. People come in to our church, been manhandled by the devil, been bruised by people, suffered injustice, betrayal, you name it, affliction. They come in there in that big choir singing, that congregation singing, whoo! <laughs> and can it be that I should gain? We start singing like that for our Lord and to our Lord. Oh, it invigorates Christians. But now that choir, it's not just that song leader out there. It's that entire choir. That choir is leading the congregation. Now, congregation folk, are fourth word people. Most congregation folk, they're fourth word people. What does that mean? They come in on about the fourth word. <laughs> All praise to Him who reigns above. You know what I'm saying? They're good by the word Him. <laughs> but now that choir has got to be first word people. First word. They've got to be on the first word. They're helping leading the congregation. And from the first word, they need to be with us. Let's do a couple more practical things. Um, let's talk about how to select music. Um, on a Sunday morning, that song we just did, Blessed Be the Name, I love that. Every song is not a great Sunday morning opening song. Rock of ages, clef for me. I like it. Is it a great opening song? No, no. I am so glad that our Father in heaven, I like it. Great opening Sunday morning song. Well, I think there's other songs that are better, a little more appropriate. Sunday morning, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. I don't know if you know that one. It's not as well known across the country as I wish it were. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Our church loves opening a Sunday morning service with that. Now, we only have, at, at my church, we only have about 10 different ones, so we're going to sing them every, you know, five different times a year. Crown him with many crowns. That's a great Sunday morning opening song. That's a great one. That's a great one. Come, Christians, join to sing. Alleluia, amen. Oh, worship the King. La, 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 la. Those are great opening songs. All right. Now, to God be the glory. What time meter is that in? 
three, four times. Now you that are just learning to conduct time a little bit, oh yeah, just go around in your car conducting time. Go around the dorms. What are you doing over there? I'm leading my congregation. Where are they? They're invisible right now, but I'm going to have me one one of these days. <laughs> and I'm practicing, you know. And you're practicing that four, four time. <laughs> and you know, um, compound meter. Let's find Jesus Loves Even Me. Um, uh, that is uh, in the hymnal. I had the number a moment ago. Who's got the number? Jesus Loves Even Me. Um, pardon me, I, I've got that. Oh, 358, 358. That's 358, yeah. Um, <laughs> remain seated, please. Now, let's conduct this. Give us a little introduction. Here it is, ready? I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of His love in the book He has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. Six, eight time, compound meter. Compound. <laughs> Got our soloist right here. I like he's aggressive. Zeal is a good thing. Da 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 da. One two three four five six. One two. You can overconduct a congregation. Too many little nuances that they have no clue what it's about. At the cross, four four time. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? You can overconduct that song. That song is so common. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did... You need one and three is really all you need, the active beats. Uh, now, you, it starts on what's called an anacrusis. I've been looking to get that word in too today. It starts on a pickup beat. Alas, and did my Savior bleed... Alas, and did uh, the song uh, we sang the other night, Oh Happy Day, da 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 da. You, you've got to, you, those upbeats, now you've got to get everybody in. You've got to own it yourself, and you've got to get that choir with you, and you've got to get those musicians with you. You've got to get that congregation, and you get that strong upbeat, and you've got to take command. And the bigger the congregation size, the bigger that arm span and all that sort of thing you've got to do. And don't keep it a mystery. I went to Bob Jones University. We had a fellow named uh, Dr. Guftison. Man, he's like 6'4". He had this wingspan out there, man. And leading and singing it, whoo, he could lead that singing. By the way, after Dr. Gus, after he retired, 75 and 80 years old, what was he doing? As an old gentleman, oh, he's still leading singing down there at the rescue mission. Amen. As an 80 year old, he's still using what he's got for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Until he died. Frank Garlock's in his 80s. He's still out preaching and still doing what he can for Jesus. Amen. I like song leaders who just stay with it all life long. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, so learn your, your time meters, um, know your hymnal. Know your hymnal. Whatever hymnal you're using at your song, at your, at your congregation or group that you're leading, know that hymnal. Know it. Bible Truth Music, for our hymnal, we spent hours upon hours building what was called the topical index, the author index, you know, who wrote the songs. We put in the index what key every song was in. Because, for example... If you start a service in the key of C, first song, key of C, no sharps or flats, key of C, should the next song be in the key of C? Eh, probably not. It'd probably be best to have a little variety on that, having the key of G, key of F, key of A flat or G, you know, something different. The Bible teaches variety, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So you have variety, variety, variety in the subject matter, variety in the style of the songs. If you're going to do three songs back to back with your congregation, don't make them all in the exact same key and all in the exact uh, same time meter and all the exact same tempo. Have a little variety. I mean, unless God leads you otherwise, use some common sense. Uh, this work as a song leader is realistic work. 
Use your sense. Use your sense. This is realistic work, not idealistic, realistic work. And so um, all these things. Learn your hymnal. Know it front and back. If you don't have a great topical index in your hymnal, buy one copy, please, of the Bible Truth hymns and get that in, the book's worth the index in the back. Would you stand with me? Our time is up. Miss Allison, I want to say a gigantic thank you to you. I wanted to use you more, but you helped us. By the way, I've got eight copies. I have eight copies right here of the Crown College Choir. We've been selling these things for $12. But these eight, if you'll come with me, to me right immediately after this, you can get them for $5 each. These eight, you can come get these eight uh, for $5. Not the whole, all eight for five dollars, five dollars each. If you come to me immediately afterwards, let's pray as we close. Thank you, Lord. Oh, please raise up some song leaders. Please, may we all volunteer to do your service, and please direct some to be song leaders. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.